Welcome, everyone. We are continuing today in our sermon series on the Gospel of Mark. Pastor Jason is away this weekend. I'm Pastor Teresa, and it's my privilege to bring you the breaking news from the Gospel of Mark. This is how we've been describing that Gospel. When you see that sign, that banner, breaking news come across your screen, you know that that's your word to pay attention, that something that you didn't know was happening is happening, and you need to listen so that you can understand what this breaking news is all about. The breaking news from the Gospel of Mark is that sin has engulfed all of creation. And like a giant volcanic explosion that fills the atmosphere with volcanic ash, sin is a barrier to God's light being seen in a dark world. The secret that is being revealed in the Gospel of Mark is that the kingdom of God has broken through that darkness in the Lord Jesus Christ. Secrets, when they're talked about in scripture, are always mysteries that were once hidden, but now are being revealed. Jesus says his purpose was to deliver the breaking news, to reveal the secret that the time has come. Jesus said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So today we want to consider how does breaking news spread? Well, that depends on how it is advertised and then how it is received. And so last week we saw that receiving the good news is a spiritual reaction that places God above everything. When I receive the good news and I let it in and let it penetrate my mind and heart and spirit and let myself be changed, be transformed by the news of Jesus coming in and bringing the kingdom of God, then everything else in my life has to be reordered and recalibrated. Remember Jesus told the story of the pearl of great price, of the man who after searching and searching finally finds the pearl. And when he finds this pearl, he sells everything else that he has in order to go and buy this pearl. That is what the effect of receiving the good news has on my life. It makes me reorder and recalibrate the things I once thought were so important. And so today in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus tells another story. Jesus always liked to illustrate his profound concepts by telling a simple story. And so today we come to the story of the sower in the Gospel of Mark chapter 4. And some of the key themes that we have been looking at in the Gospel of Mark, we see amplified in the story of the sower. Remember we said one of the key themes is that the good news, remember gospel means good news, that would be like a victory declaration at the end of a war, that the good news has broken through. And so we see that in the story of the sower, the good news is the good news of the word of God that breaks through and lets people know that Jesus has the victory over sin and death and hell. And the second theme we've been looking at is this great cosmic battle that God is at work in the world, but God has an enemy. And the enemy, whose name is Satan, is at work in the world, working against the purposes of God. 
And so we see in the parable of the sower that Satan steals the word. He chokes the word. He does everything he can to keep the word from being fruitful. And then the third theme we've been looking at is the authority of Jesus. And we see in the story of the sower that despite all of the forces that are coming against the word of Jesus, the word of Jesus produces fruit in the end. That the word of Jesus has the power to break through even the very hardest heart. And so Jesus wants us to think about how is this word spread? And so he compares it to seed, seed that is sown or planted, and seed that then needs to be received by the soil that it is sown in. This picture of Van Gogh, his picture of the sower, I actually have on the wall of my office because it reminds me of the call of God on my life. And the call of God on my life is the same as the call of God on the life of every believer, which is to be one who receives the word of God and one who sows the word of God. And so we see that this parable is sometimes called the parable of the sower. It is sometimes called the parable of the soils. And you may know this story well already, or it may be um, a new story to you. In either case, I always think a good way to hear the story again is to ask yourself a question about it. And so the two questions I want us to ask ourselves as we listen to this story again is, what kind of sower am I and what kind of soil? am I? The story of the sower comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, and first Mark gives us the setting for the story. Mark, chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. So remember, we've been telling you that Jesus spent a lot of his time in the northern part of the nation of Israel by the Sea of Galilee. And this particular story begins in a place, is told in a place that is called now the Sower's Cove because it is believed that this was the location of the story. So you can see from this picture that the Sower's Cove was a natural indentation along the shoreline, and Jesus got into a boat and went out into the lake, and the people gathered along the shoreline, and there would be a kind of natural acoustics, so he didn't need a sound crew like we need in order to produce our sermons. He could be heard by the natural acoustics of the place of the sower. So now you can have your imagination as one of the people listening to Jesus as he taught from the boat. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some a 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, 
but to those on the outside everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop some thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times what was sown. Remember Jesus said, let those who have ears to hear, let them hear. So may the Lord give us ears to hear this morning what he has to say to us. The first thing that we notice about this story that Jesus tells is what kind of a sower is this? And if I want to ask myself, the question, what kind of a sower am I? I want to learn from this example that Jesus gives us. So you notice that this sower is very generous. He throws the seed everywhere. He doesn't try to figure out ahead of time what is the very best place for me to sow this and is this soil going to receive the seed? He throws the seed everywhere which is a good lesson to us to not try to be so careful before we share the word with someone, to try things, to risk ourselves. Give that Bible to your brother, even though he never wanted to listen to you about your faith. Try and invite a neighbor over who seems to be in need of prayer. Take that reckless step to try sewing in a place where you haven't before. Join a small group. Lead a small group. Start sewing generously. The next thing we see about this sewer is that the sewer is patient. The sewer understands that there will not be fruit right away. And the sower doesn't know exactly when that fruit is going to develop, but is patient and willing to wait. And then this sower is expectant. This sower is expecting a harvest and doesn't know, is it going to come from this place or that place, but is absolutely confident that if the word is sown, it will produce a harvest. So we have a little interlude in the middle of the telling of the story and the explanation of the story, which is when the disciples ask Jesus, why are you talking to them in parables? And, you know, we call parables earthly stories with heavenly meanings, and Jesus loved to speak in parables, which were stories that told simple yet profound truths based on everyday things that the people around him would know and would be familiar with. And so Jesus basically says to his disciples that the sower understands that three out of four places where he sows the seed will not bear fruit that there is a secret to the kingdom of God that is revealed only to those with the faith to understand it. And so we see that the person of faith actually has a longing to understand the things of God. And that kind of understanding is often described as standing under the truth allowing myself to be 
washed over and to be changed by the truth, to open my heart and my life to be transformed by the truth. And so Jesus says he speaks in parables because seeing they won't perceive and hearing they won't understand. But if anyone will turn to the Lord in faith, then willing to stand under the truth, the secrets of the kingdom of God will be revealed to them. So let's look at the four kinds of soil and look at the first one, which is the seed that is sown on the path. And so Jesus said, the seed that is sown on the path, Satan comes and snatches it away, just like these birds are eating it up before it ever gets in. The seed never has a chance to take hold. It never penetrates. It never gets through to the heart because the enemy of God is there working to snatch it away. So when we ask ourselves, what kind of soil am I? We need to learn the lessons from the path. The path is hardened. It is packed down because it is open to all walkers and all birds. And we could say that's a metaphor for a person who is so anxious to be open to every possible idea, every possible idea of God, every possible spiritual thought, that they are hardened and don't have a place for the word of God truth. The word is not received from this kind of heart. And so what can we do if we identify with the soil on the path? Well, we can put up a scarecrow. We can drive the birds away. Don't let every random idea about God take root and find a home in your heart. Don't let the birds build a nest there that closes you to the truth of the living God. Jesus says his heart's desire is that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So we need to discriminate against amongst all of the ideas about God that bombard us in order to have room for the word of truth. The second kind of soil is rocky soil. And Jesus says, the seed sown on rocky soil is like those who hear the word at first and receive it with great joy. Isn't this great? Our sins are forgiven. We're going to go to heaven when we die. Okay, and we're going to have a happy life. But he says they have no root. And when trouble or persecution comes, they wither away. So the word, which is received at first, later is let go. And so what are the lessons we have from the rocky soil? I think the first lesson is that enthusiasm does not endure. I can have some emotional response to the good news, the breaking news of the gospel. But an enthusiastic emotional response is not what will endure. Faith that endures is faith that Colossians says is rooted in him, rooted in the Lord Jesus, not rooted in my own emotions of the moment. And so what can we do if we believe we are that rocky soil? We can work on putting down roots. We can immerse ourselves in worship and in the word and in prayer and in conversations with other people of faith that help us to deepen our roots. The third is the seed thrown that is sown among thorns. And Jesus says those are the ones that hear the word, 
but the word is choked out. And here is where we see the work of the enemy of God, because the word is choked out by the worries of this life. We could call that the anxiety of the age. I remember when I was a kid, the anxiety of the age was about nuclear war. And so we used to have these um we used to have these air raid drills and people built bomb shelters and people stored up canned goods in case there was a nuclear war. Every age has its worries, has its anxieties, and we can choke out the word of God by concentrating on the worries of this life. And then the second thing that chokes out the word is the deceitfulness of wealth. So what does Jesus mean when he says that? What is the deceitfulness of wealth? I think it's what wealth promises but cannot deliver. Wealth promises security and promises enjoyment and promises something that will last, but it can't deliver. And so the Lord says, don't be deceived by riches. Don't allow your desire for material things to choke out the word of God. And then finally, the desire for other things. The word is received with one hand, but the other hand is busy. And so our lessons from the thorns are Watch your priorities. Don't let the anxieties of the age overtake you and consume your mind and your thoughts. Do not allow the pursuit of prosperity to deceive you into thinking that that life is a life worth living. And don't let your desires for all kinds of other things, your desire for fashion, your desire for fame, your desire for followers, do not let those thorns choke out the word, but be rooting out the thorns. Tear them out when you find them taking root in your heart. Remember that receiving the good news is a spiritual reaction that puts God above everything else, above my anxieties, above my wealth, and above all the other things that clamor for my heart's devotion. And finally, the last soil is the seed that is sown in good soil. And that are those are the ones who hear the word and accept the word. The idea is, that I receive it, that I allow it to penetrate my heart. I don't just give some intellectual assent to it. I allow the word in and I allow it to change me. And then I produce a harvest, some 30 times, some 60 times, some 100 times. It's interesting that, that it doesn't matter to the Lord how many, how much my harvest is multiplied. And different people according to their abilities and according to the work that the Lord gives them to do will see the harvest produced in different amounts. But they are fruitful because the word of Jesus is powerful when it is received with both hands. When it is taken in, it will produce fruit. And you remember, when you open a piece of fruit, what do you find in the middle of it? Seeds. And so that fruitful person becomes a sower. Remember, the scripture says, one plants and another waters, but it is God who makes it grow. And you remember Jesus' invitation. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send forth workers into his harvest field. Would you be one who is willing to sow 
the breaking news that the Lord Jesus has brought light and life, forgiveness and liberation from sin to this broken world. Then you will be a sower. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.